Now, is this is this uh, this resolution or this intro that was uh, that was intro today? Is that about the body cameras? Does that have the potential body cameras? Does that have anything to do with yeah, those so inspections? Is this the health department? Yes. Yeah. So uh, that's kind of like uh, putting the dash the dashboard cams in. Mm -hmm. um, we believe that. But we've already partnered with the uh, Bo uh, Bodega Association, and the Bodega Association is submitting to me their own footage from their, the, way inter the way inspectors interact with them. So we've got two different degrees of footage. So you have, you know, which I'm a little unsure of how that would work if an inspector goes in <laughs> with the camera, how they're going to behave, as opposed to the store owner having his own footage of his interaction. So we're going to have both spectrums of that. In the next couple of weeks, mm -hmm. the Bodega Association has committed to bringing me at least 10 pieces of footage that illustrates maltreatment of their association members. Okay. That probably is admissible in court, more importantly, but we want to see that. And we want to take that to DCA and say, hey, you know, first and foremost, you know, before any court proceedings, take that and say, hey, here is illustrated your inspectors behaving badly mm -hmm. as it relates to a small business. How do we fix that? Interesting. Uh, on the unemployment and underemployment, so obviously helping the businesses so they have more money at their disposal that isn't going towards fines, that can help them hire more sure. or provide more hours to do to maybe mitigate the underemployment situation that you point to. Um, are there other things in terms of workforce development or other other things about the unemployment problem that that you're looking at yeah so so we've uh met with various workforce de workforce development groups to actually match uh what they're training on with what's missing in the needs of the city for example with paid sick with the implementation of paid sick my bigger concern for small businesses was how their record keeping would be substantial and sufficient enough not to get fined because what happens now with paid sick is I can come in and say, hey, Rob, let me see your books on Anna and how you're keeping your records. Now, small businesses don't necessarily have an HR department nor the capacity to, to, um, to, to keep ad adequate records. And there'll be fines ass assessed when you don't do that. So what we'd like to see is in workforce development training that you're training accountants and bookkeepers to some degree who can go in when they're not employed or underemployed and work and build a resume. Mm -hmm. So that's one way to quickly begin to assist small business, but train people for real life jobs. And who does the training? This is, this is something, you know, I know there's a lot of CBOs, a lot of community-based organizations that sort of fill in some of these gaps, but that's, that's something as we hear about new initiatives and workforce development, I'm particularly curious well, about. Well, the onus of that probably falls on SBS which is small business services, which is supposed to be the education arm. So they would be doing, we're suggesting that they do train the trainer. Mm -hmm. So those CBOs who are willing to assume the role of those CBOs and workforce development groups would get their initial training from SBS so we can be assured that it's a uniform and consistent kind of training and then those workforce development uh, organizations would be putting those people to work. Mm -hmm. That would be the formula uh, initially that we thought about. Um, now we want to sit with SBS and we want to sit with the larger workforce development organizations and find out really how it works. Because this is, this is, you know, in Rob's mind's eye, this is how it would work. But obviously, you know, that's me trying to mitigate an ongoing problem where, you know, in workforce development, people are being trained every single day and then there's no jobs mm -hmm. to match the training. So we're saying, hey, there is clearly a need for, a, for at the very least, bookkeepers. So we won't say accountants because there's a whole other track that you have to be on to be an accountant. Mm -hmm. But at least bookkeepers who can go in these small and micro businesses uh, on, you know, on, on an incremental basis and help them keep good records. And how does contracts for minority and women-owned businesses, how does that fit into this puzzle? Because I know that's been an issue that we've talked about a lot. So, so Helen, Helen Rosenthal, which is, uh, who's the chair of contracts, is my next-door neighbor at the council. And her and I constantly have dialogue around... Uh, doing joint hearings uh, to look at the city's contracting mechanism and bring it up to speed. Mm -hmm. um, really, first of all, we got to find out what the uh, percentage of contracts for MWBEs is supposed to be in the city, because it actually, right now, there's no standardized number. 
So the state has a 20%, a, a very big, hairy, audacious goal of 20% minority contracting. The city, uh, it's agency by agency. I'd like to see it as the chair of small business, and so would Helen, a more uniform formula for doing that. So, Because it's hard to regulate. If every agency has a different percentage that they're working with, it's hard to have oversight and regulate that. It's hard to even have a hearing that brings all the agencies in and say, you got, you got to do seven, you got to do 12, you got to do... So we... We'd like to somehow uniformly standardize what the percentage is for minority contracts in the city. Could the council, can the council legislate that? That's what we're looking at. Okay. I, d I don't know the answer okay. to that. So between uh, Lori Cumbo, uh, who chairs women's issues, uh, Helen Rosenthal, who's the chair of contracting, mm -hmm. and myself, mm -hmm. that's something over the next two months we'll be looking at. I have a hearing coming up uh, June 20, I'm sorry, <laughs> April 24th, which is access to capital, okay. which is another big you know, piece to this puzzle. Right. Um, so we're bringing in all the banking institutions, more importantly, all the alternative lending institutions to really show the vast array that the city provides mm -hmm. and what other alternative funding streams are there for small businesses. Because there's all, there's everything from, you know, the traditional bank loan to crowdsource funding. Right. So they, we, we need our small businesses to see the vast array and get in where they fit in. Mm -hmm. so, so another thing that, that's important is holding uh, those lending institutions uh, accountable to the Community Reinvestment Act, mm -hmm. uh, which is a federal act, obviously. Uh, so there's a lot of ways that we can drill down on everything from, you know, when I ran. So one of the things that I'm really excited about is that not very often do you get to run on a particular issue and then chair the committee that you ran on. So this is a continuation for me. So I ran on access to capital and access to technical assistance. And now I'm able to actually provide that and steer that in a way that makes sense. So that's exciting. Uh, the one thing I want to say about this uh, uh, progressive regime that's in place is I got to give the speaker, uh, Melissa Mark Viverito, credit because it seems as though she was skillful at choosing chairs that at the very least were passionate about the committees that they served on. You know, that's that's interesting you bring that up because I remember when the when that list came out and, you know, a lot of it seemed to make sense to me. People with backgrounds in certain issues, obviously, you know, there's a Danny Drum as an education chair and that makes a lot of sense. And and, and you mentioned Helen Rosenthal with contracts, so and but that hadn't been the nat the, the, the formula in, in, in past administrations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a testament to a progressive administration, I have to stand firmly on that being a critical component to the success of this council. So when I look to my left and to my right, uh, and, I'm, and I'm you know doing things with co-chairs, I feel confident when I'm calling on a Danny Drum, who's the chair of education, and I have a bill that needs to be forwarded, I know Danny's gonna, gonna go through that with a fine tooth comb. And when we come out on the other side, it'll be something that was vetted. You know, so having, having your colleagues be skilled at what they do makes for a better Council, so I'm, I'm feeling very confident that you know if I, if I go to Antonio Reynoso, if I go to Richie Torres, who is uh, NYCHA housing chair, that these people have a, 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 a long, well, those guys are really young, but a long history in on the committees that they serve. That is tremendously exciting. It makes everybody better at what they do. So, you know, if you would ask me, um, how do I feel about the council and its hundred days and all of that? I'm I'm eternally optimistic based on who chairs what. Mm -hmm. And you have to give, if you, if you say that, you gotta give credit to the leadership and you gotta give credit to Melissa Mark Viverito.